Okay. I wanted to welcome everyone who's here today for the third part of our 12 series on preventing domestic violence among people with disabilities. Today's talk is about safety planning for survivors with disabilities. Safety planning for survivors in such topics as prevalence, disability-specific abuse, system and cultural barriers, risks of leaving, and safety plan elements. Sarah Zesky, project coordinator at the New Coalition for Battered Women, manages such projects as No Wrong Door, New Jersey, and the expansion of their project, Peace, a Learned Solution. Zesky is involved with the New Jersey Coalition for Battered Women's Cultural Comedy Committee, the Internal Anti-Racism Work Group, and the White Aspiring Allies to People of Color Caucus. Also during this session, Erica Olson, Housing and Technology Safety Specialist at the National Network to End Domestic Violence, will discuss her organization and the services they provide. National Network to End Domestic Violence is a social change organization dedicated to creating a social, political, and economic environment in which violence against women no longer exists. I wanted to add that um, at any time if you need to exit the room, just X out this web, this web page, just close the entire web page. We don't have a button to shut it down, so you just have to exit the entire web page. The other thing is we are recording this session, and it will be posted along with a sign language interpreter. So for people who are hard of hearing, we will be able to um, provide a signing interpretation. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Zesky, and I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank you who logged on. Um, so Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Zesky, and I'm the project coordinator here at the New Jersey Coalition for Battered Women. The coalition is a statewide membership organization of 26 domestic violence programs. We provide training, statewide advocacy, technical assistance, and um, legal advocacy for the domestic violence programs across the state. Um, we do not do the direct service piece out of our office, um, but if someone needs direct service, they can call our office and get referred to that. Um, I am going to cover, uh, try to jam a bunch of things in. Um, safety planning is a very complex issue, um, but I'm going to cover some of the topics today and um, hopefully that will help some people who are listening. And then um, if you need more information, there's some resources at the end of the presentation. So if you go to your next slide, you'll see the topics for today um, Erica and I are going to cover. Um, we're going to cover, um, talk about some risks to leaving when people are in abusive relationships. Um, it's not always so easy to just um, go. That's one of the biggest questions we get. Why doesn't the person just leave if someone's not treating them well? Um, but that's not always as easy as it sounds. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit of, we're going to talk about risk assessment. What are the risks if you're leaving and, and what are the risks to going out um, into the world? And then we'll talk about some of the elements of an actual safety plan. If you go to your next slide, um, I just included some key terms for you to keep in mind, just so um, you're familiar with some of the words that we're going to be using today. So safety planning is defined as a process um, of supporting a survivor to identify resources and precautions that will help uh, him or her avoid re-victimization. It's really about how can we keep the person safe, what to do to be safe. Um, a danger assessment is a process of gathering the information. So um, we know that when people are being abused and they want to leave, um, it's important to figure out 
what, what is the danger at this time? And we also know that sometimes abuse can escalate at the point when um, somebody knows that somebody wants to leave. Um, and so we want to take all of those things into account. Um, and the way we define disability for this particular presentation is the product of an interaction between um, the characteristics of an individual and the characteristics of the environment, whether it be the physical environment, the social environment, um, and so on and so forth. So we're really talking about um, cross-disability, physical, cognitive, um, and sensory disabilities. Um, and also, um, I should have put in there the deaf community. If you go to your next slide, talk about some things that you should consider um, when you are trying to do a safety plan with somebody. It's important to consider the environment and the social barriers. You want to make sure you're looking at the environment they're in and the environment that they want to go to. What kind of barriers and challenges might they face leaving the situation they're in and going somewhere else? Um, safety planning should always uh, encourage self-determination. This is a safety plan for a survivor. And it's not a plan about what you or I think the survivor needs. It's about what the survivor needs and the survivor making choices that are best for them. Um, you should consider the diversity of people's needs. Um, people are not defined by their disability alone. And um, everyone has a different life experience. And it's really important to see each person as an individual and to make sure you are meeting the needs of individual people. There is no one-size-fits-all safety plan. Um, and then it should be developed with the survivor. It's, again, not something that somebody should say, well, here's what I think you should do. This is what will keep you safe. Um, but it should be to take into account what the survivor's um, situation is and what they know about the person that's abusing them and their own challenges and needs. Safety is first. This is a safety plan. Sometimes when we're talking about safety, we're not necessarily talking about what I want to do. I want to stay in my home. Well, that may be something I want, but that may not be the safest thing for me. So I need to consider all of my options. Safety first, what are my needs, and then what do I want? But all of those things need to be considered. I invite um, Erica to join in anytime she has something to add. Um, she's done a lot of work nationally on this subject, and so feel free to jump in. Um, if you go to the next slide, we're going to talk about abuser-generated risks to leaving. So when somebody wants to leave an abusive relationship, unfortunately what happens a lot of times is the person who is doing the abusing becomes aware of it and the abuse increases. And so there are not only the social and environmental barriers that are out there in the world, but there are things that make it a risk because of the person who's doing the abuse. So uh, we have a lot of information, a lot of literature that unfortunately shows that when people are leaving, it's a time where they're at risk for the highest amount of physical injury. Um, psychological harm. So the person who's doing the battering can um, make the survivor feel like they're nothing, like they're worthless, like they don't have a chance, like no one cares about them, like they're alone, like everything there is their fault. Um, and none of that is true. All of that has to do with control. That is an abuse a possible side effect to, to the risk of leaving. So if you say you're going to go 
the batter can say, well, um, you know, you're a bad mother because you're going to leave. So the psychological harm becomes an increased risk. Um, if there are children involved in the relationship, there's always child-related risks. So if you're thinking about leaving, um, you need to make sure that you're not only doing a safety plan for yourself, but if you have children, that they have a safety plan too. Um, unfortunately, a lot of abusers do use the children as a form of power and control. Um, there are financial risks of leaving. So you have to take into account where, where is the person's income? Does, does everything in both of your names? Um, do you have any money of your own? Do you rely on the abuser for financial support? And if you leave, do you have another means of financial support? Um, there's a risk to family and friends um, because a person leaving is uh, the, such a big threat to an abuser's sense of power and control. They often will go to family and friends to look for a person, to try to find information about the person. They may threaten to hurt family and friends if they can't find the person and if they can't have the control that they want to have. Um, there's obviously the loss of relationship. So no one wants to be in an abusive relationship. Everybody wants a healthy, loving relationship. No one likes to be abused. Um, and so if you're going to leave a person you have a relationship with, you are losing that relationship. And you obviously got involved with them for something, for some reason. There was something about them that, that you liked, that you enjoyed, or, or that you were, you know, lied to about, that something you thought about the person. And that sense of loss of relationship can be very hard for any survivor. It can be doubly hard for a survivor with a disability because of the isolation that a lot of people with disabilities have. And one of the last risks is involves legal status or arrest. So this is um, has to do with worrying about whether your abuser may get arrested, worried about yourself getting arrested. Um, if you are a, a person with a disability who also has um, immigrant status, you could worry about being deported or worry about your abuser being deported. And those are all risks to being in the abusive relationship and choosing to leave it. So those are all things you need to think about when you're thinking about a danger assessment. What is the what is what kind of risks are involved with leaving? If you go to the next slide, there are some life generated risks. These are things that don't have necessarily anything to do with the abuser but are kind of just part of many of our lives and are, and are things that affect all of us. Um, so, so financial risk. Um, even if the abuser is not manipulating your money, um, you may depend on them um, for financial you know, support. And if you don't have a job, don't have job training, maybe don't have an education, uh, have been found ineligible for financial assistance through Social Security or welfare, you may be very concerned about the financial risk of leaving and, and how are you going to handle having an income, having some money coming in. Um, the home location may be a life generated risk. Is, um, very difficult for people who live in more rural areas to even get out of an abusive relationship because you can't just walk down the street and hop on a bus. You may be far away from neighbors. You may be far away from public transportation. Um, in a city, uh, you may have the opposite. It may be hard to get away because um, there are neighborhoods where people know each other. And it may be hard to find a confidential location. So home location is another life-generated risk. 
the physical and mental health status of the survivor themselves. So obviously talking, when we're talking about survivors with disabilities, this life-generated risk becomes a very large thing to consider. What is a person's individual challenges around physical health and mental health, and what do they need to consider? Um, leaving, being in an abusive relationship is very traumatic. Leaving it is also traumatic. And so if somebody is dealing with a mental health disability, it could be something that aggravates it. It could be something that if you have anxiety, you feel double anxiety. If you have a physical disability, many effects of domestic violence come with physical symptoms, and it could exacerbate your physical symptoms. Um, and then there's just kind of all of the discrimination pieces that are out there in society, even though it's um, 2012 and we're very uh, enlightened society um, and people generally get along, um, there still is a large amount of racism, gender bias, um, sexual orientation bias, and if people have other parts of their identity this may be a big problem for them when they're going to try to leave and find a safe place to leave. So those are all of the things you really want to try to consider. If you go to the next slide, when you are working with somebody around doing an assessment or a danger assessment, there's a number of things that you need to set up in order to do it. So I just talked about here's some of the risks, but here's some of the things you need to do to create a place where you can get the information that you need. It's, it's a really important to create a safe place. So if you try to do a risk assessment in an area where someone feels nervous, they feel unsafe, um, it's a very public area, they may not tell you, may not be, be able to tell you all of the things that they would be able to clearly do if they're relaxed, if they feel safe, if they have their confidentiality insured. Um, so it's important to create a safe space, both um, confidentiality-wise and just comfort-wise. It's important not to make assumptions about people with disabilities. Um, even within disability categories, there is humongous variation about how disabilities affect people and what challenges people have with their disabilities. And so it's really important that you try to look at each individual person and not make assumptions about what people can or cannot do based just on their disability. Um, it's important to ask the survivor themselves what questions and concerns that they have. So again, this is not about us telling them what they should be doing, but what, what questions do you have? People are often confused, um, they're, they're scared, they're bewildered, they're depressed, and they may have a lot of questions. And most of them are usually pretty simple, like, what is a safety plan? What do you mean by that? It's important to start with addressing their questions and concerns so you can get into the meat of the conversation. Validate what the person is saying. They know their situation and they know the user better than anybody. And so some of the things that have happened in most abusive relationships is they have not been believed, they have not been um, credited, they have been made to feel stupid and worthless, and if you can validate what they're saying and really listen to what their experience is, that will make them trust you, it will help them be able to be heard, and that's something that most of them have not been able to have for a long time. It's important to use simple language, concrete language, and to avoid jargon. Um, when I say use simple language, um, please don't 
take that to mean that I expect people to talk down to people. Um, you shouldn't talk to people, you know, adults like their children. But um, especially in the domestic violence field, we like to use a lot of jargon and acronyms and this stands for this and that stands for that. And that is really hard for people to understand. And um, you can kind of lose them in the, in the risk assessment if you're using that kind of language. If you go to the next slide, um, don't pretend to understand if you don't understand. Um, a lot of times what I have seen is people working with different people with disabilities or people from the deaf community and sometimes communication takes a little more work and um, people don't without disabilities or who have hearing privilege don't necessarily want to do that work um, so someone says something to them and they say yeah yeah okay okay but if they didn't really understand it don't pretend like you understand. People that have disabilities, either speech disabilities or cognitive disabilities, they know that it's hard for other people to understand them. They're just happy that you're trying to understand them. So most people that I've interacted with, they are much more likely to actually uh, be happy that you ask them to clarify that you asked them to repeat it, then you just ignored them or you pretended you understood. It's important to ask about all of those abuser and life generated risks that we talked about. Again, safety planning is a very complicated process and it involves a lot of different layers because people's lives involve a lot of different layers. And all of that information help you able to help the person make a plan. Um, and again, the survivor is an expert of the perpetrator's behavior and their own needs. It's really important to not make assumptions about, well, all abusers are like that, so your abuser must be like that too, or all survivors experience this, so you must experience this too, um, because each one of us is different and each one of those abusive relationships is different. There are some general overarching patterns of things, but um, they're not necessarily true for every single person. If you go to the next slide, um, you need to understand that there are things on their minds other than the abuse. So like we talked about before, um, people have multiple identities. If I'm a survivor with a disability, but I'm also a mom, and I got a call that my son wasn't doing good in school, and then I go to my risk assessment with you, I may be thinking about the call I got from my son's school and not about my abuse right now. I may be upset about other things. I may be distracted. I have other things that might be on my mind. And so even though we're talking about safety and how safety is priority, understand that being a survivor is probably not the only way people are identifying themselves. And there are other things that go on in their life besides the abuse. Talk to them about what makes them feel safe and what makes them feel unsafe. So I know what makes me feel safe, but that's not necessarily going to work for Erica or for anybody else for that matter. It's important that you listen to each person's feelings about what is a safe place for them. Um, they may have trouble answering that question because depending on what their life experience is, they maybe have trouble remembering when they ever did feel safe. Um, if they do have that kind of struggle, you can ask them to imagine. Imagine what a place would be like if you felt safe. Um, ask them about where and when the abuse occurs. Uh, abusive relationships often have patterns. And so if you can try to help the survivor establish what are the patterns. Um, 
Is it happen only at home? Does it happen only in a certain room in the home? Does it happen only after um, a friend comes over? Does it increase around the holidays? Does it get worse on the weekends or the weekdays? Does it happen at night in the morning? Those are kinds of things that you can establish a pattern which may help to determine when the safest place to leave is, when the safest time. Remember that survivors of domestic violence have experienced trauma. So their reactions to things may not be what you expect their reactions to be. Um, I've had survivors tell me stories about um, being abused in a horribly physically manner and tell it in a completely even tone, Looks like they were ordering a coffee. Um, the reactions may not be the same. They may be so traumatized, so depressed, um, that they're, they've lost some of their emotional affect. And so they may be able to, to discuss what sound to you like horrific pieces of abuse in um, some calm manner. Um, so don't be surprised about that and, and don't be so quick to judge people by that either. If you go to the next slide, there are some things to think about when you're preparing a safety plan. So have they had a safety plan before? Um, either with this abusive person or if they've been with an abusive person before, do they understand what goes into a safety plan? What does it mean? Um, if they had one before, it's important, important to ask what worked in that. So sometimes um, we know all best laid plans um, don't work out the way we wish them to. And so if they've had a plan before, what worked and what didn't work? Um, if they've had a plan before, it maybe just needs a little tweaking just one or two things need to be changed. Or it may be that the whole thing needs to kind of say, well, that was your plan then, um, but, but some of those aren't going to work for you now. Your situation has changed, and we need to discuss new things in a new plan. Um, it's important to ask if people's disability status is the same or has changed. Many people who have chronic health conditions um, go kind of back and forth. They could have a good day, they could have a bad day. They could have a good couple months, they could have a bad couple months. Um, and there's other disabilities that get progressively worse. Um, there's disabilities that go into remission and then come back. And so it's important to figure out if you had a plan before, um, how were you feeling then? How was your disability status? Were you still walking? Were you able to get out of bed? Um, were you going to the doctor a lot more? All of those kinds of things. Was it different or was it the same? If you go to the next slide, um, this slide has a list of things that are important um, for all survivors, but can be especially important for survivors with disabilities. So um, medications, are they on any medications? Where did they get their medications? Is it something that they have to go to the doctor to get a refill for? Do those medications have side effects? Um, where do they keep their medications? Um, do they take them themselves? Or is the abuser in control of doling out their medications? Um, Service providers, what kind of services are they currently connected to? Um, have they been so isolated by the abuse that um, they really don't know any service providers in the area? Do they need to get connected to them? Um, if they have used service providers in the area, then what do those providers know about the abuse? What does the survivor want them to know about the abuse? And can any of them with any of this safety. What's their transportation like? Uh, we know from many people with disabilities and especially um, people in New Jersey, um, our, our public transportation system is, is not one of the best. 
Um, there are many places where buses and trains don't go. And if you have to use the state uh, paratransit, um, there's a 24-hour advance booking. And so it can't be like you call um, Access Link and you're like, I, I need to get out of my house now because he just left for the store. Um, you need to book that 24 hours in advance. Um, and there's a 40-minute window. So that might not be the best option for you in terms of getting out. Um, if you use um, a wheelchair, you know, do you need a, a van? Do you need an accessible vehicle? Transportation is a really big, important thing to think about and talk about with the person when they're doing a safety plan. Um, communication. So if they are um, deaf and they use American Sign Language, um, if they have certain pieces of equipment that they use to, to communicate, so if they have a video phone or um, some people in very rural areas that don't have high-speed internet still have TTYs, um, do they have any other equipment that they need to communicate? Do they speak um, a non-English language? Will they need a translator? Will they need an interpreter? Those are things that are important to consider. Um, finances, we talked a lot about before. Um, any assistive devices, whether it be a mobility aid, um, a hearing aid, a communication device, do they have one now? Do they know where to get another one? Um, if, do they have insurance? Will their insurance cover it? Those things are important. Um, do they have a service animal? Do they rely on that service animal to help them with their activities of daily living? If so, um, can they, will they be able to take the service animal with them? Um, will they be able to get transportation that can move them along? It's important for the survivors to know that um, service animals are covered under the ADA. And uh, for domestic violence shelters, for example, if it is a certified service animal, they are um, required to take them in shelter or to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, and then what do they need to do to maintain safety right now? Safety plan planning is a process. Um, and so if you make a safety plan with somebody, it doesn't mean, okay, they have a plan and now they can leave right now. It's a process. And so what do they need to do to stay as safe as they can in the meantime. If you go to the next slide, um, there are important things to consider. Um, safety at different locations. So safety at home. Um, they're living with the abuser. Um, it's important to find out, do they feel unsafe when they're at home? Do they have children? Um, do they have a plan um, to stay safe? Um, does the abuser meet their daily needs? So is it their primary caregiver? Do they have other caregivers that come in the house? In terms of safety planning, and as Sarah had said before, it's really important to, uh, to specify safety planning for different um, times in your life. So whether you're still in the home of the abuser, whether you're leaving the abuser, um, whether you've relocated, things like that. In terms of safety in the home, understanding when you feel safe, where you feel safe, how to the home when you um, are not safe anymore, um, what kind of necessities that you need. Um, so if this is your, if the abuser is your primary caregiver, um, being able to try to safety plan around whether or not you need somebody else to fulfill those those that role. Um, in a group setting, if, if you're living in some other kind of facility or whatnot, where, understanding where the abuse takes place, how you might be able to safety plan around that. We see sometimes that abuse takes place during transportation transportation between facilities. Um, so you'd want to try to be able to access assistance and ask for help to change how you're getting transported between place to place, maybe. Um, so it's just one example. Um, again, as the slide says, to avoid being alone with the abuse. 
Um, Sarah, did you have other points on this particular side? Um, yeah, just the other thing is, um, are there people, if you're living in a group setting, are there other people that, that you trust? So there may be um, another resident that's being abusive or a staff that's being abusive, but there may also be a staff person or another resident that you trust, that you can tell them what is happening, um, that you can confide in them, that you can say, I don't like what um, this person is doing to me, I don't know what to do about it, or would you go with me, or would you make sure not to leave the room if they're in here with me. Um, so it's important to look for who your supporters are, too. <laughs> Um, if people go to the next slide, um, it's important to safety plan not only for um, when you're at home, but what are you going to do during a violent incident? So if abuse is occurring at this moment, um, what do you need to do to keep yourself safe and sometimes to keep you alive? So are there any warning signs that abuse is going to occur? Um, it's usually a cycle, and so sometimes you can kind of see, sometimes it comes out of nowhere, but sometimes you can see it starting to cycle up. And so do you have warning signs? Um, where does the abuse occur? You know, depending on the disability, it may be hard for a person to pick up on social cues. And so you may not, there may be something that the abuser does every time, but you may not be on that. Um, and so it's important to trust your instincts. If there's something, anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or not safe, it's really important to listen to that. And if survivor is telling you that as a service provider, it's really important that you listen to that. Um, if you're in the home and there's a violent incident, you need to think about how would you get out? Wh which doors can you get out? Is there a room that you can lock yourself in that has a phone? Um, you know, can you get out of the house without assistance? If not, um, can you tell a neighbor, hey, I um, throw something out the window, call the police for me? So all of those things, how are you going to keep yourself safe when there is a violent incident? Um, are there things in the house that um, are, are possible higher safety risks? So does the abuser have uh, knives or guns or other things? Um, who can you turn to for support? Um, how will you let them know that you need help? Um, it's important to consider um, any kind of social network that the person might have, whether it be neighbors, friends, family. Some people have religious community. Some people have service providers. Some people have co-workers or places that they volunteer at. Consider all of those as possible means of support. Um, when you're getting ready to leave, if you flip to the next slide, um, you'll see some important things about um, getting ready to leave. So, um, are, are you do, do you want to leave? Are you thinking about leaving? Um, what do you think will happen if you leave? Um, where do you want to go? Um, obviously, it can be very scary to just kind of walk out of the house. Um, and do you have a plan where you want to go? Do you have a relative you want to stay with? Do you have another state you want to go back to? Who are people you can trust? Um, we talked about transportation before, and, and this is probably one of the biggest barriers to leaving, especially for people with disabilities. Um, and so it can be very complex and if you are planning to leave, it's really important to have a transportation plan in place. Um, the place that you want to go, can they accommodate your needs? 
Um, will you be able to get in there? Will you be able to get the things that you need? Um, are there people that can, if you're deaf, are there people that can use American Sign Language or can they get you an interpreter? Um, there may be a place that you want to go, but that's not accessible for you. And so you may need to come up with an alternative place. If you go to the next slide, um, there are things about getting ready to leave in terms of finances. So we talked before about you may or may not have control of your finances. So do you have your own bank account? If not, is there a way you can spun up a private one? Um, for people who are receiving Social Security benefits, um, one of the first things to ask survivors is, do they know how much their benefits are? Um, abusers will often abuse people financially take their social security checks, not give them any money, um, and, and control all of that. Um, sometimes they will even go as far as to um, convince you or trick you into making them your representative payee, and then they're kind of legally taking your money. Um, they are supposed to be reporting on that, but the reporting is um, they really don't need to prove them to have, have proof of a lot of things. And sometimes that reporting gets backlogged. And so it's not something people are checking on as a regular basis. So you need to be aware how much money you're supposed to be getting. And if you're not able to manage it yourself, try to find somebody else who can manage it other than the abuser. Um, if you're planning to leave and you, you know, want to take some clothes with you, um, you, you may need to pack a bag. Are you able to physically do that? Would you know what to bring with you? Um, consider if is it possible somebody could come over and help you do that while the abuser is at work or um, at the store or something like that. If you go to the next slide, um, it talks a little bit more about things you need to think about if you're getting ready to leave in terms of a disability concern. So is that person your primary caregiver? Do you rely on that person for your daily living needs? Do they shower you? Do they, do they feed you? Do they help you get dressed? Do they help you with your toileting? If so, um, what is your plan for getting those needs met? Um, there are a lot of services out there. And so sometimes people think, well, I can't leave because no one else will do this for me. But that's not necessarily true. Um, there are a lot of things that people are eligible for. And if people get involved with domestic violence agencies, they can help connect people to um, care nurses, to personal attendants. And so you don't have to rely on an abusive person to take care of your daily needs. Um, do you use effective technology? If, if so, you know, can you take it with you? If it's not something you can take with you, do you know where you can get another one? Do you know where you can loan something? A lot of states have assisted technology loan centers, and they'll loan pieces of equipment out for people. And again, we talked about medication a little bit earlier. Um, safety on the job or school. Um, People with disabilities are um, and Sarah, working. Sarah, can I jump just, uh, just uh, with a piece about assistive technology? Sure. Sorry. Um, so the, the assistive technology, too, is that uh, there are a number of ways that um, the abuser can be misusing um, to monitor the actions of the individual. And so it's really important to discuss that with an advocate or um, some of the assistive technology might have something that's really helpful uh, in terms of increasing your access uh, to, to other people, like a communications device. But if that communications device is something that the abuser is monitoring and could actually be able to use to track you down once you've left, then that might not be a safe device to take. So even though it's mobile and you can um, plug it and take it with you, um, you might actually want to look
look at a lending program just on a new device that with that uh, to monitor you with that device. So that'll be another important piece of understanding how assistive technology is going to be really important for when you're trying to get ready to leave. Thanks, Sarah. Great, thank you, Erica. I appreciate that that extra knowledge. Um, um, so uh, people with disabilities are, you know, not just at home, and so not just need to think about well safety at home, but also safety out in public. So, um, are you a person that has a job? Do you go to work or do you volunteer? Do you go to school? Um, Many times the abuser knows uh, where these places are. Um, they may be providing your transportation. Um, other times when if you go to school or work, you're maybe alone in the building or um, alone on a campus. Um, it's important to think about what your environment is like in those places, not just at your home. Because people that are abusive, they don't typically just abuse people in their home. And if you are trying to leave, um, many times they will um, make a, a greater effort to try to control you and may show up at your school, show up at your work. Um, and so it's important to think about safety at those places too. Who might you tell in those places? Who can you have for support? Um, do you have a safety plan for leaving the building, um, for um, being in the building? Is it possible to change some of your hours so that if they knew when you were supposed to be there before, um, then you may be able to change your hours. If you work for a company or you go to school that has more than one location, is it possible? to change your location. Um, sometimes if you work for you know a, a store brand that has stores all over the county or in other counties you can get transferred. Um, many schools have you know different branches or different campuses of this transfer. So think about say not just in the home but also outside of the home. Um, and safety with a protective order. So this is talking about people who have um, decided that this abuse is um, putting them at serious risk and they have been given um, or, or thinking about going for a restraining order. Um, this is a, a legal document that will order the person to stay away from you. Um, it does require people to um, go through a court process. It is, um, in most places, a relatively easy process. And um, in New Jersey, I know I'm not sure about some other states, but we have legal advocates at many of our courthouses who are there and will help you um, apply for a restraining order, a protective order. Um, it does not cost any money to get one of these orders. Um, many places are um, trying out some new electronic protective orders that will be able to better assist people with disabilities to um, if they can't go to the court. Um, and it's important to keep that kind of thing with you at all times. Erica, do you want to finish up talking about concluding a safety plan? Okay. Um, I'm on 20. I'm on slide number 20. Um, I think we might have lost Erica's connection. Okay. Um, well, I'll keep going, and then um, I do. You, people want to ask some questions. I'm not sure if there's any questions people have posed so far. Um, but um, to kind of conclude the safety planning process, it's really important that once you've gotten all that information and worked on how are you going to be safe at home, how are you going to be safe out, what are all these things you need to think about, it's important to review all of those key points. 
So um, the, all of that should be written down somewhere. Um, and uh, the person should be able to keep it in a safe place. But you should also make sure as a service provider that you help them review those key points before they leave. That if they have any questions about them, you can answer them. If they're still concerned about something, that you would be able to help them devise a plan for that concern. Um, it's important to think about the safety of keeping a safety plan, either electronic or um, a hard copy. As Erica was talking about earlier, abusers may be able to access your electronic devices. So if you keep a copy of your safety plan in your computer and they can get into your computer, um, you're then putting your safety plan at risk. Or um, if you have it on your phone, you know, a lot of people have their email on their phone um, and they can access that. So you need to think about um, where are you going to keep a safety plan that is safe and just keeping it electronically may not be the safest place. Um, so think about that too. Um, if you go on to the next slide, which is slide 21, um, it's important that, that you discuss any items with the survivor that need to be followed up on. So if there's something that the survivor needs to do in order to get the safety plan in place um, and, and to discuss possible scenarios and maybe even do some role plays with the person. Um, because remember, this is maybe a brand new thing for them and the thought of leaving may be very scary. And so if you walk through some scenarios, what, what would you do if this happened? What would you do if that happened? Um, it may help them understand their safety plan better and make sure that they really feel comfortable with it. Um, there's a couple um, tips on slide 22 that just go over um, supporting a person with a disability, um, but many of them I've talked about before earlier in the presentation. Um, also on slide 23, um, it's important to use open-ended questions and to really listen to the survivor's ideas. That I believe I'm back. Consider that, uh, you know, put that through enough. Um, Erica, did you have anything you want to add? <laughs> sure. Sure. Now that I'm, now I'm back, I'm I froze. Back, I, froze. <laughs> I kind of went. Are through, you able to um, hear me? Okay. Hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you good. Yeah, I, I can hear you the whole time. While you were gone, I went through slides um, 20 through 23, um, just because I wasn't sure where you went. But <laughs> if you want to yeah. add anything, if you want to add anything to those or anything about the safety planning at all, that would be great. Well, I'll just pick up um, with the, the the tips for advocates. That's where um, I was going to do most of the, the points. Anyways, but um, kind of building off of what uh, Sarah was talking about. And I also wanted to highlight a, a resource that I think would be really helpful for folks. Sarah was talking about protective orders before. I think it's um, a great resource is womenslaw.org. And I can type that in chat in a moment. Womenslaw.org actually will break down eligibility requirements for orders of protection in every. So no matter where you are, you can look into that. And it's important to look into that ahead of time. Um, so uh, I just wanted to piggyback on there, though it's a, a couple points away. but. Um, so the tips for advocates when supporting an individual, most importantly, is to really talk to talk to the survivor and ask them. So, um, so asking individuals about specific uh, disability, about their specific accessibility needs, is going to be a really important piece. Uh, I encourage everyone not to um, and survivors have an expertise in 
uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking often. And they may or may not have a, a lot of understanding about different disabilities. So provide as much information that you're comfortable with, and advocates should really ask about a lot of information. And under just a little while of building rapport for survivors to start to share a lot of information about their, their needs, when we keep asking about that. Um, Presenting information in a clear manner is always important. Sarah talked about that. Again, that kind of leads into not making any assumptions about people um, understand what information they've been given before. A lot of times, we as advocates can talk a lot in our own and uh, in our own acronyms, and that's not helpful. Um, people often relocate from state to state or county to county, and responses uh, from community programs, state laws change. So again, really important to present information very clearly in case the driver hasn't gotten that before. Being aware of your own assumptions is really important, and being aware of the assumptions of your program is really important. Uh, in the work that we've done, I've worked with a lot of programs who um, have the best intentions on making sure this is are accessible to survivors with disabilities, but unfortunately, a lot of misperceptions about what that means. Um, in terms of understanding accessibility and understanding their obligations too. So if you are an advocate and you're working with survivors who have disabilities or who are deaf, it's really important to fully understand the ADA. Uh, we hear a lot of times that programs are grandfathered in, that they're looking for certifications that aren't necessary. Um, so very important and what accessibility actually really means. And I think that goes into the other piece about allowing extra time to understand complicated choices. Understanding accessibility is, it can be really, really complicated and, and complex. Um, take technology for an example. When we talk about assistive technology, assistive technology can present a ton of risks if the abuser happens to be misusing those technologies. It can present risk for the abuser to monitor and and continue to stalk and track down a, a survivor after that person is fled, or monitor all the questions they are trying to have with an advocate um, when the abuser is not home, things like that. So it can definitely present a lot of risk. But for programs that have struggled to fully um, become accessible, which many programs do, it can be very expensive process. Um, so for programs who are struggling with that, as advocates, understanding how technology and assistive technology specifically can increase our accessibility options for survivors is going to be really important. And looking to those lending programs, because both survivors and the nonprofit domestic violence or sexual assault programs can lend out um, and grow. Um, those accessibility devices and technologies to increase your own accessibility. Another example of understanding and taking time to understand complicated choices is even the timing. Sarah broke a lot of when um, you know safety planning within different situations, living with an abuser, or preparing to leave, working, looking at safety planning from a job, and she brought up uh, the payee situation. We do see a lot of abusers. It's important as advocates to really look at the complexities of that. That might changing the payee is something that the person is definitely going to want to do if they're looking at leaving. But it might they might want to do that as one of the very last things they do before leaving, because the social administration will inform you when you change that payee. They're going to be that payee is going to be informed immediately, and it's important to really reduce the red flags. Uh, that the abuser might be notified, that the, the person might be thinking about leaving. So really looking and taking time to understand how, you know, the, all of the parts and the components of safety planning and a lot of how it can be really complex and very complicated. So really thinking those through with survivors. On the next slide, there's some additional tips for advocates. Um, I think it's really important um, to think about how to listen to the survivor's ideas about risks and resources. As Sarah mentioned, both survivors are often the expert, are almost always the expert of their, their own situation of the abuse. 
and definitely the expert of their own disability. So it's going to be really important to listen and take guidance on that. And that really ensures that our responses as advocates are going to be survivor directed, they're going to be survivor informed, and most of all, they're going to be survivor centered. And that's going to be really important to make sure that, we're, that we truly are meeting the needs of survivors. And looking at other types of agencies, community agencies that are involved, both actually within your local community to connect with a disability organization, with, a, with a, um, another victim, crime victims organization, um, but also nationally or in the neighboring state where somebody might be relocating. Connecting with the other resources is going to be a really important part of linking all services that an individual with disabilities may require or may need um, to really fulfill them and make them um, feel like they can navigate their life um, the way that they should. However, safe and confidentiality are, are critically linked. So it's going to be really important to understand your confidentiality obligations and what you can or cannot communicate and talking with survivors about how their confidentiality plays into their safety planning. So a quick example of that, we've seen in some uh, communities where building up the transportation options for people with disabilities who receive some sort of um, transportation bus card, like a bus pass, for example. We've seen situations where those bus passes are linked to an online account, which as a user, that can be very helpful to me because I can log into that online account to reload the, financial, the finances for that bus pass so I can continue to use it. But if I'm using that in the next county over, when I'm leaving the abuser and the abuser has access to that online account, it can also be used to track where I've been. So knowing whether or not things like that have online access, you know, all sorts of, you know, how do, how do the, the intricacies of, our, of the safety things that are necessary for somebody to really understand, how are they all linked together so that, you, you know, the survivor through this process can really assess their privacy and how that can impact their safety when they're utilizing those kind of services. So the last thing I just wanted to point out before, um, I know Sarah had some um, resources as well. We here at the National Network of Domestic Violence have a relocation project uh, where we can answer questions and work with programs who are working with survivors. We also don't provide direct services to survivors, but we work with programs and communities so that they can enhance their services. And we have a relocation project, um, which is a small component where we actually do sometimes work with directly with survivors to really help somebody assess the, uh, what is going to be needed for them to be able to relocate and really truly be safe when they do relocate in terms of their identity, their privacy, all of those services that they're accessing. So we have a specific email address. It was just relocation at nnedv.org. And you can ask those kind of questions that come up to that. So that's a really good resource. I encourage people to let us know if you're working with somebody and they are relocating and they want to really kind of explore how they make sure that they're safe when they do that. I think those are all the pieces, if I remember correctly, running through them very quickly. Um, Sarah, did you want to go with Sarah, did you want to go with no, no, Erica, that's that's great. Um, I, I don't know, Roxanne, if people have any us, um, or if we'll just um, conclude this slide by saying if you are um, a person with a disability that is, you know, being abused, we encourage you to, to reach out for help. Um, there are a number of uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking agencies um, in across the country and in New Jersey we have at least one in every county um, and we encourage you to um, talk to somebody about um, you know your your safety um, and if you're a service provider um, we just ask you to keep all the things that we we're talking about in mind and and understand that um, survivors with disabilities may have
have more complex needs, but they deserve just as much safety as non-disabled survivors.